Good morning. I'm Will Cuervo. And I'm Alicia Sharabali. And welcome to The Global Current. We begin with a report from Stephanie Siegel detailing negotiations between the Colombian government and guerrilla organizations. Earlier this week, the Colombian government announced that it has resumed peace talks with the guerrilla group known as the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. The talks, which opened in Oslo, Norway on October 17th, have brought the two sides back to the negotiation table after a nearly 10-year hiatus. The FARC, a guerrilla rebel group, has been engaged in a campaign against the Colombian government for over 50 years and is considered among the wealthiest rebel groups in the world. But the resurgence of state military legitimacy coupled with a revived Colombian economy has served to weaken the FARC's domestic power and influence. The FARC took an even bigger hit in 2010 when the Colombian government took down its leader and has struggled to regroup and reclaim its position in the state. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos announced in September that the government has decided that now is the most appropriate time to restart negotiations between the parties. President Santos acknowledged that the timing of the peace talks fully intends to capitalize on the FARC's loss of power over the last decade. Given the violent nature of the FARC's past activities in Colombia, President Santos has vowed he will not sign a ceasefire until the peace talks have reached a, quote, satisfactory conclusion. The FARC has a bloody reputation in Colombia. In addition to its militant past, it has allegedly used kidnappings, drug trafficking, and illegal gold mining as a means to fund its campaign against the state. Despite ideological differences between the two parties, the president has stated that he is cautiously optimistic about the outcome of the renewed negotiations. Despite ideological differences between the two parties, the president has stated that he is cautiously optimistic about the outcome of the renewed negotiations. After the initial peace talks in Oslo, the process is scheduled to continue in Havana, Cuba, until a resolution can be achieved. Stephanie Siegel, The Global Current. Somalia continued its path to democracy on Wednesday when President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed appointed and the parliament endorsed Abdi Farasher Don as prime minister. UN Special Representative Augustine Mahiga lauded the country's accomplishment, calling it further incontrovertible evidence of progress. Somalia's last instance of a functioning government dates back to 1991. The country has long been plagued by factional fighting and general lawlessness. Prime Minister Sherdan's next step will be to form a cabinet. He has pledged his government will work to ensure security and fight terrorism and piracy. In other news, Cuba has announced that it will repeal a major travel restriction it has had on its citizens. Staffer Angel Colon has more. Cuban state media has announced it is ending a major foreign travel requirement for its citizens. The widely anticipated policy change to the laws, which will take effect on January 14th, intends to update Cuba's stringent travel laws in order to more accurately reflect its citizens' current and future travel patterns. The Castro government has long judged citizens desiring to leave the state as traitors or enemies. Under the current set of laws, Cubans seeking foreign travel clearance have had to endure a long and costly process in order to receive a permit. Once the law takes effect... Cubans wishing to leave the island temporarily will no longer need to obtain a government-issued travel permit, a document that in the past has been withheld for political or arbitrary reasons. The most recent reform will require only a passport and a visa for foreign travel. Cubans, who are currently allowed only 11 consecutive months abroad, will have their leave time extended to 24 months under the new system. Despite the change, not all citizens will be allowed to take advantage of the new rules, as Cuba is maintaining its right to withhold visas for, quote, reasons of public interest defined by the authorities. Additionally, the government announced it would keep in place special travel restrictions on citizens who fall into professional classes in an attempt, as the regime puts it, to preserve the human capital created by the revolution from the theft of talents practiced by the powerful nations. The government's fears are not without precedent. Havana previously loosened immigration rules in 1980, which resulted in tens of thousands of Cubans leaving the island to seek asylum in South Florida. This episode, dubbed the Marielle Boatlift, counted among asylum seekers some criminals and the mentally ill, and create a logistical and humanitarian crisis for the United States. Angel Colon, The Global Current. Police are searching for seven major paintings which were stolen from the Kunsthal Museum in the Netherlands this past Tuesday. The paintings, which include works by Picasso, Matisse, and Monet, could be worth up to $260 million. The Kunsthal Museum, located in the Netherlands' second largest city, Rotterdam, was built in 1992, and according to Rotterdam police, it had a state-of-the-art security system. Despite this, the thieves were able to break in sometime after the museum closed and steal the paintings before the police were notified at 3 a.m. local time. While the police have few leads and are relying on tips from the public, 
it is thought to be equally as hard for the thieves to turn the paintings into cash. According to Alice Farron Bradley, director of the Art Loss Register, the value of the paintings to the thieves could be hundreds of millions of dollars, less than in the open market. When we return, Olivia Coulson continues our coverage of the Colombia government and FARC talks in Oslo, Norway. Stay tuned. Just minutes from New York City and a few hours from Washington, D.C., the John C. Whitehead School of Diplomacy and International Relations is an ideal place to study international relations and practice diplomacy firsthand in a professional, dynamic, and culturally rich setting. For more information, visit diplomacy.shu.edu. Welcome back. New staffer Bilal Bahadur offers his take on Israeli, Iranian, and United States relations in light of the U.S. presidential election. Speculations are growing about how U.S. relations with Israel could change given campaign rhetoric on foreign policy and possible pressure from the Israeli Prime Minister himself, Benjamin Netanyahu. With the election in less than three weeks and the foreign policy debate tomorrow, the candidates are trying to prove to the American people that they will do their best for their country. Israel, through Jewish American support and the Israeli lobby, has made America's relationship with Israel a top priority of America's Middle East foreign policy. Netanyahu is pushing to increase sanctions on Iran because of its potential nuclear weapons program, and Israel expects a lot from the United States. Is Israel using rhetoric against Iran around a pretext to waging war, or is it for other reasons? Would Mitt Romney support such actions if he takes the presidency? It's impossible to tell specifically, and at this point, only time can tell. But what is clear, however, is that Israel holds Washington's attention to the strong pro-Israel electorate in America and its fear of Iran. Given that Romney's positions are somewhat similar with Netanyahu's, chances that this dynamic will change in a Romney administration are slim. Bilal Behedr, The Global Current. Continuing our coverage with news out of Colombia, staffer Olivia Colson provides this analysis about the potential of these negotiations. Representatives of the guerrilla Marxist organization, known most commonly as the FARC, met this Wednesday with Colombian officials in a series of peace negotiations aimed at settling the half-century conflict between the rebel group and the Colombian government. The peace talks had to be postponed on several occasions previously as international arrest warrants for several members of the FARC were temporarily lifted in order to permit their travel to Oslo, Norway. The FARC, which stands for Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, or the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, has been a fully developed and violent organization since 1965. The organization was established as a military wing of the Colombian Communist Party and strives to represent Colombia's rural poor in the face of the oppressive ruling bourgeoisie. U.S. influence within domestic Colombian affairs and the threat of monopolization of natural resources by multinational corporations. On August 27th, the current president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, announced that the exploratory talks with the FARC had been initiated, with intent to permanently end the conflict. Santos maintained that he would learn from past mistakes and maintain military presence across the entire Colombian territory during negotiations. Al Jazeera reported that the recent shift of cooperation between the Colombian government and FARC rebels can be attributed to the mediation of Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. Chavez had pushed for the Colombian government to recognize the FARC as a belligerent force since 2008. Such recognition would force the FARC to abide by the Geneva Convention. Last year, Santos recognized that an armed conflict existed in Colombia, a step that his predecessor, ex-president Alberto Uribe, refused to take. The Guardian also credits Fidel Castro's contribution to the realization of the peace negotiations, as the Cuban leader hosted the back-channel talks between Santos, FARC representatives, and Chavez in his own country. After nearly five full decades of opposition, the FARC remains an influential and dominant player in Colombian politics. At its peak, the FARC controlled around 35% of Colombian territory, and the Colombian government reported that its forces numbered around 16,000 members. Financed primarily by illegal means, such as ransoms and extortion schemes, the FARC is also heavily involved in the Colombian cocaine trade. A 2009 report by the U.S. Government Accountability Office stated that the FARC accounts for 60% of the cocaine exported from Colombia to the United States. Due to its methods of ransom, kidnap, and assassination of wealthy landowners and international and domestic officials, the FARC has been classified as a terrorist organization by several governments, including those of Colombia, the United States, and the European Union. Because of the FARC's terrorist tactics and domestic threat, the Colombian government has employed a combination of martial forces and diplomatic tactics in attempts to weaken and eventually dismantle the Marxist group. These past attempts, especially those pursued diplomatically, have been less than successful. In 1998, Colombian President Andrés Pastrana presented the FARC with a demilitarized zone the size of Switzerland, intended as a confidence-building measure. However, 
the FARC utilized this area to strengthen their military capabilities. During a series of peaceful negotiations in 2002, the FARC broke the ceasefire by launching a large mortar attack on the building where the incumbent Colombian president, Alberto Uribe, was being inaugurated. Past diplomatic attempts having failed, the hardline approach enacted by ex-president Arube and monetarily funded by the U.S. has yielded promising results. After a decade on the offensive, the Colombian military has successfully removed a number of high-ranking and mid-level commanders from the FARC's ranks. In 2010, Mono Jojoy, the FARC's main military strategist and overall second-in-command, was killed by Colombian troops. And later that year, the Colombian military also killed FARC Supreme Leader Alfonso Cano. With FARC leadership significantly shaken and the quantity of deserters on the rise, the Colombian military has reported FARC forces at a low of 8,000. These reductions in FARC capabilities, paired with political action taken by Santos, has produced general optimism regarding the current peace negotiations in Oslo. Santos has already enacted new laws regarding land reform and victim restitution, preparing his country for a post-conflict phase. Hopeful comparisons have already been drawn between FARC leader Rodrigo Echeverri, better known as Timochenko, and Jerry Adams, an integral figure in the North Ireland peace negotiations. Heather Berkman, an analyst for the Eurasia Group, said in a research note, We see a strong likelihood of agreement sometime by spring of next year, as both FARC and President Juan Miguel Santos will probably be keen to come to agreement before the 2014 presidential elections approach. And finally... Technical producer Paul Murphy sits down with the Northern Illinois University associate professor Abu Bakar Ba to discuss turmoil in northern Mali, possible intervention, and its wider implications for the region. Uh, the Mali conflict since the coup in March has, has kind of been unreported in a lot of media. Um, can you help set the stage for the coup, uh, not, only, uh, not only the coup itself, but the events that happened afterward? And who exactly are the groups that are actively participating in the conflict? We know it's the, uh, the Tuareg rebels in the Maghreb, but um, is there any other kind of active participants in there? Well, I mean, I think... Uh, there are three kinds of things uh, which maybe we can say four. I mean, uh, I guess let, let's see how that goes. Uh, that somehow provides, I guess, a context for understanding uh, the coup and uh, what follows. Uh, the first one, of course, is uh, the long standing you know, uh, Tuareg rebellion, uh, which uh, was geared towards uh, seeking uh, independence or autonomy for the northern part of Mali uh, for a host of reasons, uh, political, cultural uh, reasons. Uh, why the Tuaregs, I mean, have uh, never really accepted uh, being part of, uh, you know, uh, Mali of itself. Uh, so that has been going on, uh, and I think uh, that provides a context in the sense that uh, uh, you know, as uh, the military or the Malian military loses ground, it provides uh, you know reasons for discontent within the military and so forth. Uh, so that that's one kind of context. Uh, but I think the, the more important uh, context, I think, is uh, the destabilization of uh, the northern African region. Uh, you know, uh, in part, I mean, due to uh, you know, the fall of the Libyan regime and the movement of uh, combatants and, uh, or, or, you know, militants, uh, weapons, uh, and also, I mean, the wider, if you wish, uh, you know, vacuum in the north uh, that have actually allowed, uh, that is, uh, the, uh, it, it is held part of Africa, uh, which has allowed, you know, uh, um, Islamist, uh, to uh, inf uh, you know to 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 gain more grounds, uh, building upon some of the economic and uh, social problems that are there. So that that's a second fa a factor. Uh, but I think the movement uh, of uh, you know heavily armed people from uh, Libya, I mean, uh, aggravates uh, if you wish uh, or hinders the ability of the, uh, the Malian military to deal with the situation or to contain it, and of course, I mean, that becomes a source of discontent. Uh, this, uh, the third element, I think, is, uh, is the nature of uh, the, the economic and social conditions and to some degree political conditions in Mali uh, of itself. Uh, now, Mali was a democracy, but uh, I mean, we have to understand that uh, mostly what we mean by democracy is uh, 
uh, governments that are elected by, you know, through some kind of multi-party uh, elections that we generally assume to be free and fair. Uh, but that doesn't really uh, touch the essence of uh, what most of the citizens uh, are really looking for. I mean, you know, people don't just want election, elections for the sake of elections. I mean, they want elections uh, with the hope that the governments can, uh, you know, uh, improve their uh, economic and social conditions. Uh, and I think in many ways, I mean, uh, the government that existed in Mali, like many others, uh, didn't actually uh, uh, succeed much in uh, improving things like good governance, uh, uh, you know, uh, improving economic and social conditions and so forth. And uh, the third, uh, I guess, context, which may be minor, is, uh, is the military of itself. I think... Uh, there are a lot of, re- I mean, there are a lot of reasons why coups happen, and uh, in rare cases, or in some few cases, I mean, the, you know, uh, the military can actually be, you know, can justifiably, if you wish, uh, take out a very bad government, uh, and of course, move quickly to restore democracy. I mean, that happened before in Mali. I mean, in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, when uh, the previous the former dictator was deposed. But I think in this case, I mean, uh, there's an element of lack of, if you wish, uh, you know, uh, professionalism or, you know, sufficient mili- uh, civilian, civilian control of the military, which I think allows for uh, the military to, you know, uh, use uh, uh, various uh, problems as a, co- as a pretext to actually uh, seize power. So I think, I think th- these are like the four kind of things which... Uh, uh, sets, if you wish, a condition for understanding what uh, was the uh, what happened there and what has been going on. Okay, um, and then uh, you talked about how the with with Libya it, the arms. Do you, do you, would you say that the because the Tuareg rebels and the and the Maghreb are they're 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 heavily armed? Would you say that that they got some of that armament from Libya? Do you do you think that you can trace that back to um, the fall of the uh, of Gaddafi? Well, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't know all the intelligence uh, report, uh, you know, uh, reports, but I think, uh, but I think, uh, based on uh, you know, uh, a lot of credible uh, you know, uh, media reports and and uh, you know, talking to people that are, uh, if you wish, familiar with uh, events and so forth, I think, I think it's clear that in uh, uh, when the Gaddafi regime fell, I mean, a lot of actually fighters. By the way, I mean, some of some of you know, uh, Gaddafi had recruited you know uh, uh, fighters from uh, uh, the Sahel, including the Tuareg area. So uh, a lot of those actually withdrew, and uh, and uh, when they withdrew, they did, uh, came out with, with, with weapons. So yeah, so there are actually some uh, I think uh, fairly credible uh, you know information that suggests that uh, you know uh, uh, people withdrew from. Uh, Libya with heavy weapons, and some of those heavy, heavy weapons have actually ended in the, in the Sahel. Um, and then you talked about how the Tuaregs never felt uh, like like they, they never accepted themselves as part of Mali, and a lot of them claim that they face discrimination within Mali. How valid do you think this claim is? How um, how real is that discrimination? Well. <laughs> I, I, I think I mean it, it, it is a fair uh, uh, claim, but uh, but again, w- again, one has to put it in context. You know, uh, the uh, discriminations, or if you wish, uh, you know, uh, nepotism, favoritism in politics uh, uh, is very widespread in many actually uh, uh, developing countries. Uh, in, uh, you know. Uh, multi-ethnic, diverse, developing countries. When you have, uh, a, fairly in, uh, when you have uh, a state that is actually not well-developed, again, by that I mean in terms of its institutions, uh, its, bureaucr- you know, its bureaucracy, its, procedure, its procedures, its, uh, uh, in the infrastructure of the state, uh, when it is actually not well-developed, uh, uh, you add that with a history of colonialism which was built around uh, you know, uh, dividing the world, uh, you know, empowering one group, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a way to uh, exert, uh, you know, uh, colonial domination on all the groups, 
And when you do have a context of dictatorship, again, which Mali was uh, for a very long time on the, on the, on the Musa Tower, uh, you know, what you, what you often have are political systems that are actually thrive on nepotism. Now, nepotism is actually, uh, you know, it's uh, doing, I guess, uh, it's, favor, it's favoring, uh, you know, one's, uh, one group uh, in the distribution of uh, political and social goods of others. And that's a very uh, common thing in many African countries. And uh, uh, in that sense, I mean, I think, not, but this is not just true for the Tuaregs. I mean, there are many other groups in, uh, in Mali, too, that may have actually felt that uh, because, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the ruling class or the ruling, uh, uh, the, gov- the, uh, the, uh, the leadership of the country didn't, uh, you know, uh, come from the area, I mean, they may have actually lost out. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a fear uh, perception, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to have. How aware do you think the military was when they when they did the coup back uh, in March? How how aware do you think they were of the Tuaregs uh, starting an uprising in the north? How how aware how how do you think that they that they thought that it was a a, a real possibility and a real threat to them or? Do you think that this, the Tuaregs just kind of seized on this? It was a sudden thing. It wasn't planned in advance. They weren't. They weren't. I guess waiting in the shadows. Well, I mean, you know, the the, the, uh, the conflict in the north has been going on. I mean, the, Mali, the Malian military has been engaged, and I think before the coup, I mean, that uh, conflict did intensify. Uh, in other words, I mean, the uh, the combination of the Islamists and uh, the Tuaregs. Uh, you know, did actually uh, intensify very much and put a lot of pressure on the Malian uh, uh, military. So, uh, I think uh, it may be, uh, as I said before, I mean, you know, the, the lack of professionalism and uh, and civilian uh, control over the military may have actually explained why the military exploited the situation to engage in a coup. But I think uh, I, I don't think it is. Uh, it, it was a fabricated situation. I mean. There was there was a genuine uh, security problem there, and uh, the Malian military was actually losing ground. Okay, um, there have been reports of individuals destroying shrines to saints and mosques, and in, in what UNESCO is calling uh, fanaticism. Uh, I think it was in, in Timbuktu. Right. Um, who is? Uh, do you think that the, who basically who's pushing for the the not only the, the this kind of uh, ultra fanaticism where people are destroying these these shrines and uh, to the saints and, and some of the mosque um, who's kind of who's kind of adding fuel to the fire and and not only doing that but uh, also pushing for the strict institution of Sharia law I mean that's led to the stoning death to two stoning deaths and 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 a few amputated several amputations. Um, in the north, who who is this? Is this the, is this at the heart of the Torah argument, or is the, is someone um, kind of commandeering their their push for uh, independence into into this kind of uh, fanatical um, I, fanatical ideology? Well, you know, I mean, uh, inf- information from uh, from the area is still sketchy, but uh, but I think uh, one convincing narrative of what is happening is that. Uh, is that uh, the, uh, uh, the Tuareg had a long-standing conflict uh, with, the, uh, with the Malian state, which, which was simply uh, largely I mean, a secular question of uh, you know, uh, autonomy and political independence. Now, what happened is that uh, 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 Islamists, uh, you know, again, keep in mind, I mean, there has been you know, uh, Islamist, uh, if you wish, expansion in uh, Northern Africa and uh, Sahel for some time. I mean, you can go back to Algeria, I mean, the feast and, uh, uh, in the back, I think, in the 1990s. Uh, uh, so, I mean, there has actually been Islamist, uh, uh, again, by, by Islamist, I mean radical uh, Islamic, Islamist expansion in, the, in the Northern Africa. So what happened, uh, at least one of, one of the credible na- narratives is that, uh, uh, those Islamists, in the wake of the uh, fall of the Libyan regime, uh, actually did came, uh, you know, to to uh, to northern Mali, and uh, they formed an alliance with uh, with, the, with the Tuareg. Now, uh, this, of course, uh, for the Tuareg, I mean, it uh, it was a way of actually helping them fight the government. Uh, but I think uh, what the Tuareg later on learned is that I mean, they do had, if we wish, different. Uh, 
uh, agendas. Uh, while the Tuareg had a much more political uh, in agenda, the Islamists had a much more ideolo- ideological uh, Puritan kind of uh, you know, agenda. So, so, uh, so after, you know, after uh, the, uh, I think that alliance seemed to be actually crumbling. And I think most of those things that you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, destruction of shrines and uh, and uh, you know, uh, enforcement of some kind of uh, uh, strict interpretation of Islamic law, uh, that actually is not. It, I think I don't think it's most. I, I don't think it's from it's from the Tuaregs, but whether it is from the Islamists who have actually come, come there. So, do you think that if if that uh, if that agreement is, is is crumbling, do you think that it's going to start becoming a Kind of a a, th- a three front kind of conflict within Mali. Not only the the Mali government or the the Mali um, coup leaders and ultimately the military fighting the Tuaregs, but also the Tuaregs fighting the uh, the Magra- or the Islamic militants who are trying to institute Sharia law. Um, do you think it's going to start? Do you think that it could? I guess uh, evolve into that kind of situation where you have three parties all fighting against each other. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there is that tendency. I mean, there is that that possibility. And and uh, and again, part of, part of the issue here is that this you know, uh, you know uh, this is not just a Mali issue, especially I mean, you know, the the Islamist angle of of of, of I guess of of, of, the, of the security issue there. So yeah, I mean, there is a real possibility here that we do actually have. You know, uh, uh, two kinds of conflicts. Uh, one is the, uh, the outstanding uh, conflict with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Tuaregs, uh, and the other one, of course, is uh, if you wish, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, is- uh, the, the Islamists who are actually in Mali and but also in some other places. So, uh, yeah. so we do have uh, uh, a three, uh, you know, three parties here. Now, the, for the Islamists, I mean, I think we we tend to. Look at it through uh, large. So for the Tuareg community, you know, we tend to think of it in the mode of civil war, and uh, for the Islamists, we tend to think of it in the, mo- in the mode of, uh, you know, of uh, terror, you know, uh, terrorism. Uh, and in a way, I mean, we, uh, uh, in some ways, I mean, you know, uh, we fight those war or those conf- or those issues differently. I mean, uh, to conventional civil or traditional civil wars. Uh, versus uh, what has actually been uh, called, uh, you know, uh, terror to, you know, uh, counterinsurgency and do sorts of things. So, but I think uh, that that is a real uh, uh, problem. There, I will even go further on that that it is not just uh, you know having uh, a three-way battle in Mali, but also actually one that uh, a three-way battle uh, that is uh, that is beyond the borders of Mali. Um, and then you talked about the ECOWAS troops. There's three hundred. There's three thousand three hundred that are that are planned on being de- deployed um, to the area to 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 help with the the conflict ongoing in Mali. Um, one thing that's kind of uh, just just blatantly obvious is that where where the Tuareg rebel where the fighting is on is is going on is in the middle of the of the Sahara Desert. How does that? How does how? how I guess how uh, is a military campaign really going to be that effective, or is it going to be ultimately futile from from solely from the geographical problems that it's going to face? And one, I, there was an article that that uh, that quoted that that was discussing it um, that the the Mali troops were basically training on uh, trucks that were going across shrubland, uh, and that was the closest thing they could get to to, to desert-like conditions. How, is a military campaign, campaign going to be that effective in those conditions where, where the, the troops are not uh, used to and they're not, they're not trained for that kind of um, combat? Well, a, a couple of things. The first is that uh, ECOWAS military operations, at least going back to Liberia and, and Sierra Leone and to uh, the Green Mali too, I mean, they have actually tended to be based on which the model that uh, the, the wider international community has an interest in what is going on in those places. And because of all the politics and uh, difficulties of uh, you know, Western powers to contribute troops, African countries uh, are ready to contribute the troops on the understanding that Western powers and other interested parties will help with the logistics. As always, the entirety of this interview, in which we also discuss the ongoing conflict in Nigeria, will be posted online on our blog, blogs.shu.edu globalcurrent.
Once more, I'm Will Cuerva. And I'm Alicia Sharabali. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of The Global Current. See you next week.